Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out on what is already uh, a cool and even perhaps damp autumn evening in Melbourne. The seasons have changed. And thank you for coming especially to this, which is one of the first events of any kind, I expect, since so many restrictions. It's the first event which um, has been organised uh, in conjunction with the Carolyn Chisholm Library. Those of you who um, were at previous launches of works by Rob or at other talks uh, will understand that the library um, has a fairly broad, both capital and small c, Catholic um, uh, task of promoting faith and culture. And we've had the privilege of being involved in launching works of Rob before, including uh, books and CDs. So we're delighted that this is the first library event. Um, it's being held here because there are going to be some changes in the library's functions, including, I think, a change of venue. But um, uh, we haven't finally settled. Um, we, we, we haven't um, perched our foot properly on our new venue, but we'll let you know about that. Uh, I should also note that we're here through the kindness and generosity of um, the Catholic Women's League who own this house, Mary Glary House. And uh, some of you may not know, uh, this house was originally 19th century house of, I imagine, I think a prosperous doctor. Um, but Mary Glary was uh, an Australian doctor um, qualified um, in the early years of the 20th century. And then uh, after qualifying, not just with the basic qualification, but as a doctor of medicine, um, she felt drawn to serve the people of India as a doctor. And she did that both as a doctor and as a religious sister. And uh, there is perhaps a bit of a race on, I don't know, but she may turn out to be the second Australian canonized saint. Her cause at least is underway uh, she lived and worked uh, for much of her adult life in India. Uh, but this house is named in her honour, and that's her picture there. Two people I just need to mention, and I'll do that only very briefly. Dr Paul Watt, um, who until recently has been a lecturer in musicology at Monash and is to be a visiting fellow at the Australian National University. And I think some of you have been to events launching works by Rob may have met um, Paul before tonight, and Rob himself. Um, Rob is um, something of a phenomenon. Uh, he is prolific in publication, both in writing and in performance of music. Um, and the scope of his study is vast as well. Politics, international espionage, and very thorough, detailed um, musicological study and uh, performance on the organ. So um, uh, Rob is um, one of those um, people who instantiates, I think, a, a high level of civilization and we're honored to be here on this occasion. So Paul, thank you, or Rob, or in whichever order it should be. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be asked to, to launch this CD because I, I obviously did a good job launching the, the one before this, which I understand was August 2019. That's correct. So uh, here, we are, here we are almost two years later, which backs up your, your point of view that, that Rob is busy and industrious. And not only has he produced a second CD, but has finished a doctoral dissertation of probably around 90, 100,000 words. Um, and I think that embodies a really good example of the performer scholar, someone who is a, an organist, a, a performer, a professional church organist, and also writes as, as well. It's, it's, a, it's a good combination. It's something that, that few do well. Rob does it brilliantly. Um, French romantic church music, who'd have thought? Um, Rob has done the French a favour in addition to the British favour by, by drawing us into or drawing out of relative obscurity a number of composers and the milieu in which they worked. I'd never heard of André Guillemont before. That's a show of my ignorance. 
Um, and I was captivated when I got this because I, I used to teach courses on 19th century music and of course there was always French stuff in there but never organ music or never music that, that is featured on this CD. And as Rob mentions in the program notes, you know, a lot of us get to Vidor or Saint-Saëns for a... and that's kind of it. Um, unless we have a, a more detailed knowledge. And we get lots of detailed knowledge um, in this. So the, the innovative or the interesting thing about this is not just Guillaume, it's his milieu, his, his circle. And I guess Rob could have written a very large article about it, but we, we have a sonic version of this, this milieu. And it, it might be a stretch, but you can, I think you can hear the connections in some respects between some of, of the pieces. You can hear the environment in, in, which, in which they, they worked. Um, Gilmore is an interesting character, and I was talking to Rob Jarts last week, and I think he might have an inkling to do a little bit more scholarly work on, on right. Gilmore. Yeah, and it, you know, there, there's lots of stuff that I read in the program notes, or the CD liner notes, rather, um, that he, he went to the St. Louis exhibition, gave 40 recitals. Now, I'd love to know... From memory. From memory. <laughs> like, who was there? What did the reviewers say? What did he play? Who, who did he hang out with? I'd, I'd love to know. Yeah, so much more detail. It, it's, um, it's really fabulous. The sound in this is, is terrific. I, I have very um, primitive, um, despite being a musicologist, I have a very primitive sound system at home, and I was shocked at how good, even on my, my um, ancient equipment, how good, how good this sounds. And I think it sounds good for a number of reasons. Obviously, the, the technology in the, uh, the uh, recording was, was very, very high quality. The organ is great, I don't, don't know too much about organs, um, but the, the choice of registration um, gives us lots of colour in the music and, and the voices of Elizabeth Barrow and Emily Tam, Paulina Vayanis, Leighton Triplo and James Emerson are really good choices. The blend of the registration of the organ and the sound of the venue and the organ, it is really well coloured. I think is the right word, the colours. The musical colours are, are all terrific and I was quite surprised how beautifully all those elements work, work together. I have to say though, I was a bit surprised when, I, when this arrived in the mail because I, I, I opened it up and um, as you can see, if you open it up, and uh, I was looking forward to the liner notes as much as I was the CD because Rob makes great liner notes. I didn't see that this crafty thing fits in here. <laughs> and so I was thinking, cost cutting. No, no, problem. and it wasn't until I, I sort of flicked it across my desk or something that this, this fell out. And, and so I think, I think, you know, there's probably lots of CDs are produced like this, but I just thought that was a very beautiful um, packaging. And I thought it was well worth mentioning at the launch because it is very beautifully done. Um, I'll also say just finally, um, that the, packa the, packa the packaging is good, the, um, the uh, sound is good, the um, program, well, not the program, that's no, the CD liner notes, Robert, are so excellent. You know, that you just want to keep listening and you want to know more because they're so, so engaging. I've listened to it half a dozen times. Um, if you haven't got a copy, you must buy one. I can't recommend it highly enough, Robert. It is a fabulous production and we look forward to CD number three or four. I hereby launch the cell. I'm not sure what I do with it, whether I pick it somewhere, but um, it, it's launched. And Rob, wonderful congratulations on a job so well done. Yes. Thanks very much indeed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a resounding thank you to Dr. Paul Watt for his most generous words about this new recording. And if the ANU is going to be making use of Paul's great scholarship and teaching skills, then Monash's loss will be the ANU's gain. Secondly, a resounding thank you to all of you who came tonight. It would, would have been entirely understandable to live in fear that we might have needed to cancel the entire event the way that the Blues Fest recently needed to be cancelled in northeastern New South Wales. But no, you all made it. 
and thanks very much indeed for carrying out the chore of needing to sign in uh, before the event started. I always hate having to sign in either via a QR code or via the conventional pen and paper. I mean, it always feels like being ordered to write a get well note to Daniel Andrews or something. <laughs> but anyway, thanks very much for doing that. The last time that Paul very kindly launched a CD with which I'd been involved was in August 2019. That was at the Carolyn Chisholm Library. In August 2019, it was a different world, a pre-COVID world with everything that this implies. It was a different world for me specifically in one respect, because back then I was only about one third of the way through my doctoral thesis, which I devoted to the organ output of Sir Charles Villiers Stanford. I completed the thesis and handed it in to the Sydney Conservatorium on St. Patrick's Day this year. Back in 2019, it's fair to say, none of us predicted the crisis in higher learning which the pandemic brought in its wake during 2020. None of us predicted the near annihilation of the full, full fee-paying STEM student bodies at most Australian campuses. Similarly, none of us predicted the widespread enfeebling of paid employment prospects among those who, like myself, stayed on campus to complete their own graduate studies. The pandemic-induced disruption to timetables and finances confirmed the wise words of that great philosopher Mike Tyson, who famously pointed out, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. I don't intend to say much more about the coronavirus, especially when myself, I myself haven't been treated too badly. There's been talk of my being able to obtain some paid academic work at the Sydney Conservatorium during the second half of this year. Naturally, I hope that this work comes about, touch wood. At a time when nobody knows how big the student body at any tertiary institution is going to be by that stage, the dangers of possible hubris on my part are all too evident. Amid academe's current crisis, I miss more than ever the chance to talk things over with the man to whose memory this new CD is dedicated. I refer to the late great Father Paul Stenhouse, polymath, polyglot, and perhaps above all, the brilliant editor of Annals Australasia, that indispensable periodical for every Australian concerned with the Catholic Church. Father Stenhouse, that's all I can do to talk about him without being overcome by emotion. Father Stenhouse was quite simply the noblest, holiest and most erudite man whom I've ever known. To those in this room who likewise knew Father Stenhouse, no explanation is necessary. To those who didn't know Father Stenhouse, I fear no explanation is possible. Happily, his friend, colleague, and co-religionist, Dr. Wanda Skowronska, has recently had published her biography of Father Stenhouse, which is at the side there on the bench. And if you haven't already read this biography, I would recommend that you do so. My own debts, both pedagogical and moral, to Father Stenhouse are greater than I can ever hope to repay. Anyone who knows how frustrating, panic-inducing, life-devouring and financially perilous a task it is to put together any magazine, even for three or four years, will be astonished by Father Stenhouse's diligence. Father Stenhouse kept annals going, not for three or four years, but for the better part of half a century. Annals' readership was not only confined to Catholics, it included plenty of Protestants, Jews, Muslims, some Hindus and Buddhists, and the occasional atheists. But all the readers, whatever their religious backgrounds, discovered in every single issue of Annals what Evelyn Waugh called a full philosophy with which to oppose the follies of our age and nation. Annals pervade not wokeness and not whiggery, but wisdom. It pervade not fields, but facts. It pervade not clickbait, but culture. 
Amid the grief which so many of us have felt at the cessation of annals, one factor remains constant. Yes, it's perfectly true that the humanities in the Australian universities of 2021 are endangered by the pandemic's aftermath in a way unimaginable during 2019. But whatever dire problems the humanities face nowadays, I remain convinced that these problems are comparatively solvable as against the cognitive and moral decrepitude of present-day Australian mass media journalism. At the last CD launch in 2019, I recounted the rake's progress of Greg Sheridan, who boasted, not least on his ABC webpage, of a non-existent bachelor's degree. Being a school crossing supervisor myself, I also pointed out that any school crossing supervisors who similarly boasted of non-existent bachelor's degrees would be blacklisted for the rest of their lives. What I didn't mention then, and what is worth mentioning now, is the truly breathtaking tolerance for plagiarism within Australia's mainstream media. In this connection, I can't resist pointing out Exhibit A, the totes amaze balls Bangladeshi-born, Sydney-based psychiatrist Tanvir Ahmed, whose career saga included not only a position at the Advertising Standards Board, but a column in the Sydney Morning Herald, as well as the even more distinguished intellectual powerhouse Mamma Mia. The first sign of trouble appeared when ABC Television's Media Watch, in September 2012, discovered that Tanvir Ahmed had lifted word for word whole paragraphs from an article in the New Atlantis Quarterly based in Washington, D.C. In the same article, Tanvir Ahmed lifted entire sentences from the New York Times, from two British publications, the Financial Times and the New Humanist, and from a neuroscientist's presentation at a 2010 academic symposium in Sydney. I repeat, all these literary thefts occurred within the space of one newspaper article. Well, whatever his shortcomings in the column writing department, you've got to hand it to Tanvir Ahmed as an absolute master of the non-apology apology. When he'd been confronted by his employer with all this evidence, he told the world, as my overall output, I, was, I believe, demonstrates, those instances are uncharacteristic and out of character. Regrettably, it turned out that his Sydney Morning Herald discovered no fewer than six columns in as many months, where Tanvir Ahmed had simply copied and pasted great chunks of material from other writers without the smallest attribution to the original sources. As a result of this, the Sydney Morning Herald decided that it could do without Ahmed's services, whereupon he acquired a column at the Australian. That role also he managed to lose for exactly the same reason that he'd lost his Sydney Morning Herald role. This time, he filched passages word for word from another British periodical, namely Prospect. Even at this stage, you would have thought Ahmed might have salvaged some particle of self-respect by admitting to what he'd done. He could have said, my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. After all, those of us who are Catholics must publicly utter these exact words every single Sunday morning. And we utter these exact words without being thereby traumatised or triggered or offended or oppressed or needing safe spaces. No such luck with Tanvir Ahmed. Upon being confronted with his latest interest, instances of authorial light-fingeredness and complete failure to credit his sources, Ahmed took to Twitter and there proclaimed, this case is inadvertent. Inadvertent? One wonders what caused that inadvertency. Did Tanvir Ahmed's fingers copy and paste all these other people's words by themselves? All joking aside, Every single day in my work at the school crossing, I meet seven-year-old children who are much better at taking personal responsibility for their wrongdoing than Tanvir Ahmed, now aged 46, seems to be at taking responsibility for his. But never say die. It takes more than losing two consecutive nationally famous gigs because of plagiarism to deter the Tanvir Ahmeds of this world. 
This is all, of course, on the public record, and any Google search will confirm what I've been saying. Scarcely had Tanvir Ahmed taken his leave from the Australian than he wound up at Spectator Australia, only to be outed there too in July 2017 for having quoted at length in a cover story, once again without any attribution, an article by American philosopher Carl Elliott in The Atlantic. Upon this discovery, Spectator Australia appended to the online version of Tanvir Ahmed's cover story a sheepish note acknowledging the original Atlantic source. In this sheepish note, it managed to misspell Carl Elliott's name. Never mind, Tanvir Ahmed is still getting routinely published, still turning up in the Australian Financial Review and on Sky News. Am I so foolish as to suppose that Australian academe has been entirely free from plagiarism? Of course not. Well over a decade back, Monash University's own vice-chancellor had to resign when his own plagiarism became notorious. Yet, within Australian academe, I must concede there are straightforward and universally acknowledged formal procedures for combating plagiarists' efforts. Perhaps still more significant among Australian academics than any formal procedure against plagiarism is the wider university ethos, an ethos which is intangible but also recognisable. Within Australian academe, even plagiarists avoid boasting about being plagiarists. They don't play the victim card and they don't delude themselves into thinking that their stealing was just an unhappy accident. In short, they don't habitually act by Tanvir Ahmed. In this connection, I find instructive a remark from 1960 by George Kennan, the eminent US diplomat and political scientist. Now, Kennan was no ivory tower professor. He'd headed Aust America's embassy to the USSR during the very time when Stalin was at his most murderous and unpredictable. But in spite of this, he remained a genuine intellectual with a genuine perception of the difference between history and journalism. This is what Kennan said in a magazine called the, Vic the Virginia Quarterly Review. I quote, the study of history is something that cuts us off from the age in which one lives. It represents, let us face it, a certain turning of one's back on the interests and preoccupations of one's own age in favour of those of another." Unquote. Well, that's what I've ended up doing in two ways. First, by finishing and submitting the doctoral thesis. Second, by bringing about this new CD. The research and the preparation which I had to undertake for both these demanding projects meant that I needed to go entire months without reading a single newspaper column. Somehow I coped. When the Melbourne's lockdowns were at their worst, I did repeatedly wonder whether recording the French romantic church music CD could ever go ahead. Was it doomed to be forever an impossible dream? Fortunately, I had five excellent singers lined up to take part in the recording, and I want now to pay a special tribute to each of these five singers. Lizzie Barrow, Paulina Vianas, Emily Tan, Leighton Triplo, and James Emerson. It's very unfortunate that four out of the five singers haven't been able to attend tonight, but I'm delighted that Leighton is able to be here this evening. So please put your hands together for Leighton. Miles Davis once recommended that every black adult American be automatically given a, medical, a medal for stoicism. Miles' actual phrasing was more vivid. He said, give them a medal for putting up with all that crap. I feel a similar awe at the stoic endurance of Lizzie, Paulina, Emily, Leighton and James. In the all day recording session last November, a session that would have tested the work ethic of a dozen coal miners, these singers all overcame our obstacles to sound as fresh at the end as they sounded at the beginning. They did so despite the necessity, thanks to sonic balance considerations, 
of singing at the ground level of the church while I was cooped up in the organ loft. Can you imagine the coordination and timing problems which inevitably occur when singers can't see the organist, when the organist can't see the singers, and when the organist can't see the microphones either? Sometimes it was hard for me merely to hear the singers, even during my softest playing. In order not to fall behind, I was obliged to play every organ note a crucial half second before the singers sang it. Scary, and no less scary at 5 p.m. than at 11 a.m. But these singers all acted as if it was the most natural thing in the world to be totally out of the organist's sight line. They reminded me in their diligence of how the long ago British diarist and drama critic James Agate described a professional. Agate wrote, A professional is one who can do the job even when he doesn't feel like it. An amateur is one who can't do the job even when he does feel like it. Unquote. On this criterion and on every other criterion, these five singers are the professional's professionals. And the same can be said for genius recording technician Thomas Grubb. It's a great shame that Thomas can't be here this evening, but everyone who knows Tom's extraordinary skill and musicianship as a producer will realise that the musicians whom he's recording this very night will greatly benefit from his expertise. Almost half of the compositions included on French Romantic church music have never been recorded by anyone else. I hope that the result will increase public awareness regarding a musical genre which is sadly overlooked on the whole. Moreover, I'm delighted to have had the chance of putting remunerative musical employment in the direction of Lizzie, Paulina, Emily, Leighton and James, as well as of Thomas Grubb himself. But I mustn't end this talk without announcing my gratitude to Father Brendan Reed of Camberwell's Basilica. It was entirely due to Father Reed's goodwill and to his willingness to take a chance on us, which he need not have done, that we were permitted to make the recording in Camberwell's Basilica at all. The organ in that basilica is a marvellous instrument, a joy to play on, benefiting from a sumptuous acoustic and excellently suited to the style of French repertoire from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I don't see why not. I've got almost no voice left, but if you can cope with my sounding like a frog with COVID, I dare say that um, I can answer questions, sure. I just wondered about the, um, uh, how you say there's not uh, much literature on the um, French composers. Was there much uh, literature in French at all? Um, there was some in French, but there was rather less than I had expected. For example, if you look up the New Grove uh, entry on Alexandre Gilmore himself, you'll find that it consists very largely of reminiscences by his pupils, very often American pupils writing in English, because he had a huge following in America, and in particular in Missouri, as uh, Paul Watt uh, mentioned. But once those pupils started dying off in about 1930, 1940, there's practically nothing uh, and even the French have not been notably solicitous about keeping his memory green. So there's a little bit out there in both languages, but astonishingly little of it um, appeared after the Second World War. And scandalously, there is still no biography of Gilmore. I'd like to write one if I can get somebody, you know, to put up the money in the shape of an ARC grant or something like that. Because I think that somebody should definitely write one. He appears to have been such a nice chap that it'll be hard to make a biography interesting. I mean, as a friend of mine said, there's not much media mileage to be made out of a headline like, hero's feet not made of clay after all. But 
I think somebody should uh, give Gilmore the honour of a biography. And, uh, well, I mean, as Schoenberg said when his commanding officer in the Great War said, are you the composer, Schoenberg? He said, somebody had to be. Nobody else wanted the job. <laughs> I have just a, a question, if you, either, either the general or the specific, Rob, but if, um, if yours is the first recording of a number of these pieces, so then up to the time of your recording, these pieces existed only as they were first performed or performed from time to time, but otherwise just sitting silently in the scores in libraries. And so I suppose my question is either, uh, what put you on to this music yourself? Or, but also perhaps more generally, what, what, what do you think it, it says about perhaps our knowledge of the musical heritage that is there? It seems that perhaps there is an enormous amount of good music that nobody knows about it because nobody reads the scores. I think that is a very good question, and I wish that I could give it a good answer. My, all I can say in response is that I found extraordinarily useful the online catalogue of the Bibliothèque Nationale and uh, such subdivisions as Gallica, uh, much of which is just free to use. Uh, there are also a good many details to be derived from websites like World Cat, which you almost certainly uh, know about. It's astonishing just how much sheet music is listed on the libraries that are registered with World Cat in all sorts of odd places, and particularly before COVID. You know, it was a work of only a couple of hours to... Uh, find something on the Bibliothèque Nationale or the IMSLP database uh, or something and go through the standard discographies and ask, I wonder if this has been recorded before. Nine times out of ten, either it had not been recorded before or it hadn't been recorded for something like 40 years. I mean, it might have turned up on a tiny little Luxembourg record label producing seven-inch... EPs in 1958 or something, and that's about it. So I had the sensation of falling down the rabbit hole like Alice in Wonderland and thinking, this is too good to be true. But it wasn't too good to be true. Again and again, not always, because some of the Gilmore material and some of the other composers' material on the CD has been recorded by others. But again and again, I found these compositions, which gave no internal clue as to why they had been neglected for well over a century. And I thought, if I don't revive them, who else is going to? And, you know, nobody is going to pay good money to listen to me making the 158th recording of the Vidor Toccata. But I thought that maybe I could interest people in this comparatively obscure repertoire, and that was the reason that I produced this CD. Also, I hoped that it would look good on my resume as far as possible academic employment is concerned, but we shall see. Any other questions? It's probably more for your um, engineer, but how did you cope with the trams going past and cars? And <laughs> Leeton will be able to give corroboration for my otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative, as Poobah would say. But the fact is that we were horribly vulnerable. Any church in Melbourne is vulnerable to tram noises, motorbike noises, ambulance noises, police siren noises, birdsong, surprisingly enough, um, maniacal kids uh, playing in a nearby playground. And there really is nothing to be done about it because, you know, we, we would be in the middle of a take 
and quite often it seemed to be going very well when the, um, uh, the dreaded signal would come and the red light would go on in the organ loft and through the headphones I would hear Tom uh, saying, sorry, tram went past. And uh, so it was, and uh, all the singers will testify to this, very often it was a phrase-by-phrase -phrase process and, you know, the amount of the extraordinary amount of repetition which is involved um, is, for me at any rate, and I suspect for a lot of other people, the most demanding aspect. Because these days, music lovers have the expectation that what with CD technology and the clarity of it, every note pretty much has to be perfect. The days when somebody like Arta Schnabel or Alfred Cortot could you know make a few very obvious wrong notes in the Hammer Clavier Sonata, and it would still get recorded and become a classic. That doesn't happen anymore. In many ways, I wish it did, because we have lost as well as gained something. But there is just no way in the world that a recording producer, especially one as brilliant as Thomas Grubb, would allow any wrong notes on a Schnabel or Corto type. Um, uh, scale, so it was it was pretty nerve wracking. But I'd like to think that the result justifies our labours. I hope it justified the great expense involved, and uh, the the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Thank you. Well, perhaps um, unless there is any other question. Perhaps, if I may simply, uh, Rob, thank you very much for your labours and for inviting us into um, this celebration of a great achievement. Thank you. And it seems to me that um, uh, I, I think um, Cardinal Newman says at one point that uh, an important part, a desirable part of human life is that we should become part of a chain of connection between persons, and his own motto, core ad core loquitur, heart speaks to heart, um, bears that, that uh, interest that he had. It seems to me that what you are doing in bringing um, fine music from obscurity into knowledge and to being preserved it is a very great work of culture and uh, something that is in the finest tradition of um, music and scholarship, and we thank you for that. And we hope that lots of people buy thousands of the copies. Thanks very much.